I'm going to invite Jeff Batiste to join me on the stage. Jeff is a project manager at the district, and we're going to talk about some of the considerations that we all need to keep in mind as we make decisions about future infrastructure, including whether or not to, talk, to install safety grades. Thanks, Holly. Hi, everyone. Um, here's our project site, Little Dry Creek Plaza in Englewood. And you can see the safety grade at the downstream end. It's an interesting project, but also with an interesting backstory. So if you'll allow me, I'm going to rewind and start with the history of Englewood through the lens of Little Dry Creek. Englewood's origin is at the confluence of Little Dry Creek with the South Platte River. This 1888 rendering shows the historical alignment of the creek. The heart of Inglewood is along this stretch of Broadway, and you can see the creek pass under Hamden and Broadway on its path to the river. It's also this intersection that is the site of our safety grate project. Through some digging, I found a nice collection of historic photos of Little Dry Creek in Inglewood. Some show people enjoying water, like kids playing in the creek, or people riding in a canoe during high flows. But most of the historic photos of Little Dry Creek are of flooding, when the creek is neither little nor dry. The earliest photos are from the flood of 1913, seen here overtopping Broadway. Here's the flood of 1927 undermining Broadway and destroying homes. There's the flood of 1933 and 1956. A side by side of the same intersex intersection, history does find a way to repeat itself. Here's the flood of 63 where Little Dry Creek passes Bannock Street. And of course, flooding Broadway. And last, here's the flood of 1973 at Hamden and Clarkson and here downstream of Broadway. We'll come back to the flood of 1973, but let's talk about development. In the 60s, Inglewood followed a national trend and built a large shopping mall called Cinderella City. It was the largest mall in the world when it opened in 1968. It was located north of Hamden and east of Santa Fe. Just out of curiosity, who went shopping at Cinderella City? <laughs> All right, maybe less hands than I was guessing. So, some of you might feel old. Um, <laughs> it clo it closed, closed a while ago. Um, hiding in the background behind the mall, you can see an open channel. But where did the rest of the creek go? Here's a 1937 aerial before the mall showing the path of the creek from Broadway to Santa Fe. Here's that same alignment in 1953, some development creeping in. Now in 65, with Cinderella City under construction, you can see a drastic change occurring. The, the purple is, is all where we're seeing a new box culvert. So the mall was completed at the end of the 60s, this 1978 aerial shows that half a mile of Little Dry Creek is now in a box culvert. That culvert was extended in the 1980s to its current alignment shown here in 2022. The culvert starts just downstream of Broadway and runs almost all the way to Santa Fe. With the culvert in mind, let's return to that flood in 1973. You can see the end of the open channel. It passes under Broadway and makes a sharp turn and goes underground. Here's that culvert entrance. It's turbulent, it's unsafe, and it's the entrance to a half mile box culvert. If we zoom in on the entrance, it definitely looks kind of scary. But when the floodwaters go down, the risk of getting swept into the culvert seems small. The flood of 1973 marked a historical turning point 
for Little Dry Creek and Inglewood. The ensuing 15 years resulted in significant flood control improvements, and it changed how the community viewed the creek. The main flood control improvements were the upsizing of Inglewood Dam and the construction of Holly Dam. These two dams, shown in dark red, bisect the basin and cut peak flows in about half. The 70s and 80s were also a transformational change in the human connection to Little Dry Creek. In this 1981 photo, you see Little Dry Creek as not much more than a roadside ditch. And here's that same reach rebuilt in the 80s. We see trails, park space, and kids playing down by the creek. These photos are from a National Geographic article about the national trend of getting people outside and the creation of greenways. Downstream of that greenway project, where the open channel ends, there was also a new plaza project, which created a pond with numerous water features, shown here in 1989. The plaza had fountains and cascades, supported by an underground pump system that recirculated water from the pond. An impressive project in downtown Inglewood that invited the community to experience water. But where is the creek going? What happens when it starts to flood? Hidden below the surface of the pond is the entrance to our long box culvert. The pond was held by an inflatable dam, and that dam would automatically deflate when water levels in the creek rose. The downtown plaza project was an amazing feat of water engineering, but it was also a high maintenance facility that had a design life. The fountains eventually stopped running and the inflatable dam failed. What remained was the old concrete bottom. This old plaza was not, no longer serving the community, with maybe the exception of some skateboarders. And in 2019, Inglewood and MHFD partnered up to reimagine this space. So this gets us to our project. And well, we're going to kind of pass it back and forth a little. But here's a conceptual layout of the vision for the new plaza. Like its predecessor, there's a large focus on community values. It has new trails, a new crossing. It has park space that can be used for community events. And it has a grand staircase that, like all the other elements, it invites people to come down and experience the creek. We started construction of the new plaza in April of 2022. Seen here, you can see us breaking out the old concrete bottom. On the left is our dewatering setup. That's muscle wall running down the side. Uh, here's, you see void-filled riprap creating the new channel bottom, setting boulders for a new drop structure. Looking upstream on the project, we now have the creek flowing through its new alignment and work is being done outside of the channel. Here's some before and after photos and another post-construction photo. I'd like to shout out a great project team here, the design firm for American Engineering and DHM Design, the work was constructed by Naranjo and Western States, and this is just the first phase of this sort of plaza redevelopment. It's going to be a great asset to the community when it's done. And pause there, and I'll come back, but uh, hand it over to Holly. All right, so when we are looking at bigger watersheds, we sometimes t have to navigate competing safety concerns, and that can be really tricky. On Little Dry Creek, we had a, a hard lesson learned. Uh, the district had just done all of this research that I mentioned on safety grades. And according to our current criteria, um, this is a culvert that absolutely needed a safety grade. And that is the direction that we gave the team and our partners. So first, it's important to understand what we mean by competing safety concerns. Safety grades keep people um, from entering a culvert that could be dangerous for one of many reasons. Maybe it's long, it has bends like this one, or it could be pressurized. A competing safety concern would be, this is a watershed where we have a, a really high potential for debris load, and if we have clogging on that safety grate, we could cause flooding somewhere else, and, and which is worse. 
How do we maintain the grate? And what if we have to maintain it during an event, which it presents just an, another safety uh, consideration? And then we also consider other tools that we have to mitigate injury in the absence of a, of a grate, signage, closures, public outreach. For as much as we want to invite people to the water and encourage them to value streams and make a case for keeping streams open, how effective can we be in dissuading people from entering a stream during a flood? And on this topic um, of people entering flood water, we have another dramatic video. Uh, I, I would not try and drive a sedan through that. I really would not. What are they gonna do? Oh, no way. What are you doing? You're literally driving right into it. What are you doing? What is this person doing? What are, you're driving into the creek. No, 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 stop. Stop, no, no, no. Okay, that got bad very quickly. Uh, should we go down there and help? So, uh, good news, the girl was okay. She is out of her car, uh, and there are some people walking over to help her right now. So, uh, she is okay. That is the important part. Her so, that one had, uh, I'll go back so you can see it. The, no, I won't. I'm just going to keep going. That one had that, a good outcome, right? She, she survived. If you noticed, that creek was tree-lined. So even the, the tree line did not keep that driver from just driving straight into the creek. Um, we found, we, this, is, this, is not, this is not actually an uncommon scenario. Uh, here's another one, a similar case where unfortunately the driver did not survive. He did the same thing. He got uh, sucked into a long circular cul culvert after he exited his car. Uh, and this is what it looked like. And I will show you the police report, but just looking at, at this angle, you see if, if this was full of flood water, there's no barriers that are signaling a potential hazard. He was simply trying to turn around or he missed his turn. This is the police report. And his car got stuck on that culvert. And so one thing that we hope that all of you will take from this presentation is just stepping back from that design and making sure you know what a site looks like when it's full of water because in so many cases that we reviewed, people were walking into or driving into what looked like still water and found something very different under the surface. It's also important to look at um, the past incidences and the numbers. When we look at the small, small circular pipe, these are really dangerous. We're, where we were looking at box culverts, of the 40, of the 40 instances of uh, injuries and deaths, really only a handful were in box culverts. That's not to say they're not dangerous. It's just to say there's some different numbers involved. And in a couple instances, people went through sometimes long box culverts with multiple bends. This one is on Westerly Creek. And in September of 2013, a blind man and his dog went under this grate. Uh, this was previous, before we added the horizontal bars at the bottom. Um, and multiple 90 degree bends, several blocks, and he survived and his dog survived as well. We love dogs at the district, so I wanted to report back on that. Um, they both survived. Here's another one uh, that outlets into a pretty dangerous looking area and, and another survivor. So this one had uh, a happy ending. I'll just say that based on what I've seen on any day, I would rather go through a box culvert even a long one with bends than any circular pipe. But it's really important that we give a thoughtful evaluation 
and make a decision on whether or not to put a safety grade on a box culvert. And I will turn it back over to Jeff to talk specifically about what we did with Little Dry Creek. Okay. So returning to our Little Dry Creek Plaza project, there was an important decision to make regarding the entrance to that long box culvert. This culvert is a dangerous place to enter when conveying floods. Shown in purple here, it's, the pipe is 3,680 feet long, has numerous bends, and most of the pipe, the lower 3,000 feet, is smaller and flows under pressure in a major flood event. If a person were pulled into this culvert during a big flood, they would spend over three minutes traveling through the pipe, submerge for most of that ride, and the risk of dying would be high. With this danger in mind, the owner team decided it was necessary to protect people from entering this culvert by including a safety grate in the project. Here's a few more construction photos, these of the grate. We have supporting pillars down the middle, I-beams laterally, and here's what it looked like when we completed construction in September of 2022. Here's a few weeks later, we started getting debris on the grate that backed up water onto our site. It was concerning, but it was manageable, and the grate stayed mostly clean through the winter months. Um, but when rain started in the spring of 2023, we realized we had a much bigger problem on our hands. The big eye opener started on May 10th. Over a 48 hour stretch, Little Dry Creek got about five inches of rain. Here's the grate the morning of May 10th. No debris. Here's the grate the very next morning, 24 hours later. Debris is stacked about nine feet high on the grate. Flow in the creek is about 200 CFS and rising. Here's the creek in the afternoon looking upstream. Our project is underwater. It was starting to sink in that we had a major problem and it was scary. A continuous flow of sticks, branches, and other debris. Over half the grate was clogged during a minor flood event, and the risk of overtopping the culvert suddenly became very real. As flow continued into the evening of the 11th, Englewood mobilized equipment to clean debris off of the grate. Their crews monitored, monitored the site overnight, and without this active maintenance, it would have overtopped in the dark. The peak flow during this event was about 400 CFS, not, large, not a large peak for this creek, somewhere between a two and a five year event. But 48 hour rainfall depths were above a 50 year event at places in the basin. It took four days for the creek to finally recede. Flows were sustained above 100 CFS for about 90 hours, a rare occurrence for a flashy creek. And when the flow finally did subside, our new trail and vegetation was covered in sediment and we had a major debris problem to solve. Following the flooding, we worked with the city on how to manage the site and left the grade on as we explored other ways to manage the debris. To be clear, we did anticipate debris maintenance during design. We constructed an access route for servicing the grate. However, we had not foreseen the sheer quantity that we, we would be left maintaining. So if we zoom out, where's all this coming from? The source of all this debris fits in the context of the Little Dry Creek watershed. The upper half is disconnected by the dams, but the section in green is primarily Greenwood Village and Cherry Hills Village. In these rural communities, creeks wind through large private parcels with a rural character. Riparian vegetation is largely unmaintained and creates significant debris loads in our watershed. It's about 13 square miles there in, in, in green. As many of you know, last year was a very wet year. Here's the site on June 22nd during another minor flood event. A high profile project or highly visible project in downtown Englewood. 
So what would happen if the culvert overtopped? In this image, you can see the overland flow path as delineated in the 500-year floodplain shown in pink. We highlighted structures that are in that floodplain as well. It's about a 3,000-foot overflow path that goes through streets and businesses. It crosses Floyd Avenue, and then there's dozens of houses that would be at risk of flooding. So by the end of the summer, we had made the decision to remove the bottom panels on the grate. It does provide clearance to pass regular debris, but it also adds the risk that someone could pass under that. We also had to zoom out and reevaluate our approach to safety at the culvert entrance. There are competing hazards where reducing one risk increases the other. How could we properly balance the risk between someone getting sucked into the culvert versus the overtopping flooding? To help us make an informed and defendable decision on the future of the grate, we got the help of Wright Water Engineering to look at alternatives and their impacts on public safety. What we came up with was a scoring matrix to inform our decision about the grate. And just generally, here's what the matrix is doing. In the rows, we've identified all the hazards, big and small. In the columns, we've looked at a number of different alternatives, anything from grate modifications, debris capture upstream, to daylighting the culvert. This analysis is informing our decision. Oh, sorry. So then, all that together, that color scoring gets weighted by those different hazards, and we get a score for each alternative. This analysis is informing our decision about the grate going forward and is important documentation that we are prioritizing public safety. So here's the grate a few weeks ago. Flow peaked at about 300 CFS, and we didn't get any debris accumulation at the grate. It's a site that we're continuing to learn from. And here are some lessons learned when thinking about safety grates for large box culverts. There isn't, you know, maybe one thing that's coming out of this is there's not a one size fits all on this. But the biggest consideration on our project was debris. What is the character of our watershed? How much debris should you expect and what types? You should have a maintenance plan for managing that debris. You should provide maintenance access, and in particular, think about maintenance access from the top. We had only provided it from the bottom and during a large flood event had to create separate access to pull debris off the grate. Finally, other things such as signage, closures, and other operational decisions that will keep people out during flooding may be things to consider. I'll give it back to Holly to close this out. So Jim Watt said this well the other day, with hard infrastructure comes hard problems. And this, was, this, this has really been a hard one. We learned that balancing competing safety hazard involves some detail. Uh, when we reviewed those hazards specific to this site, we ended up with eight different alternatives and a few actions we could pair, we could pair with them to increase their effectiveness. We needed to look at a range of flow scenarios, how the public access the site, and again, that question of what does this look like when it's full of water? There's no, there's really no, there was no clear winner here. Um, and there's no winner in a site that has competing safety concerns. Uh, so what did we decide? There were some easy wins. We decided to install a camera that would give us a visual on the grate at all times. We selected improved and very direct signage, implying that you have a good chance of dying if you enter the water, if you enter the culvert. We selected to close the area based on forecast. So when the forecast um, when it's, when it's triggered, um, the, that whole area that you see coming into it will be closed off and the signage will be very obvious. And we decided to continue to monitor the grate in its existing configuration. We know that there's a chance that someone could pass under the grate during a minor event, uh, and that would be a really scary ride, and they also might survive it, just like that man and his dog on Westerly Creek. Uh, and there are also some flow scenarios in which this configuration could keep 
someone from entering the culvert uh, under a pressurized condition that would likely drown someone. So Jeff presented the rich history of this site, and it was a story of repeat flooding, but also the start of a movement that placed real value on our streams and keeping our streams open. Uh, the lesson for all of us is that public safety is part of community values, and the decisions that we make right now are just as important as the decisions that came before us. In the end, we had to reassess risk after the project was complete. The scoring matrix provided a framework for discussion. We didn't use it like a formula. It allowed everyone to come to the table and put aside their gut feeling on what needed to be done just for a moment so we could look at all the benefits of different scenarios. And it's safe to say that in sharing this lesson learned, everyone on this team would have preferred to go through that during design. Thank you.